What's up, dog? There's almost nothing more personal than how you express yourself. And in California, everyone has something to say. That peach is jacked up. What you mean, fool? Hey. <laughs> You're gonna like give him props and it's gonna be something sick. In this last part of our journey, we'll travel the West Coast and explore an America that speaks many languages. My grandpa cooked dinner every night. How do you co-switch this into mainstream American English? My grandpa cooks dinner every night. And computers who only want to be understood. Navigation menu. Navigation address book. Navigation menu. Address book. Pardon me? It's like a... Ripping, blasting good time. So ask yourself... Do I speak American? Do you speak American? Do you like speak American? Do you speak American? Do you speak American, dog? Do you, Do you speak, speak American? Tu parles américain? Is that I'm not American? Do You Speak American? has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, promoting excellence in the humanities. Additional funding is provided by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. In our previous episode of Do You Speak American, we looked at what's happening to Southern speech. The farther south and west you go, the stronger the influence of Spanish. Concerns about Spanish echo across the American Southwest, New Mexico, Arizona, Southern California, where we're going to continue this journey through American language. The first stop is LA. It's a bit far to drive, so we're going to fly. Spanish is just one of the language influences we'll look at as we follow the West Coast from L.A. to Seattle and ask, do you speak American? It's called Mex to the Max, and it's hosted by Patricia Lopez. I hope you guys are sitting down because we have an hour, a fun filled hour for you guys. Tenemos el estreno de La Chica Sexy con los Tucanes de Tijuana esta noche. Patricia, known as Patty Longlegs, is the former fashion model who's now a VJ, that's video jockey, introducing Latino music and salsa videos on local TV. My language is Spanglish. It's, uh, it's great because it's half English, half Spanish. And you know what time it is, baby. It's time for the emails, yes? All right, let's get started with the first email here on this segment. It says, Estaba cambiando los canales y miré su programa y se me hizo muy interesante. I would like to ask you to play El Gavilán. Se llama Ricardo Cerda. Thanks and good luck. Love you always. That came from Angel. Oh, yeah. We have all these Latin people that are coming over to the States. And, I mean, we're everywhere. And we might not feel comfortable speaking English. Well, they should catch on to it. And we're, you know, we're putting it out there for them. Why should they catch on to it? Because it's, it's going to be the second language of the state. Everyone speaks English, so they say. But you have a lot of Latinos that are coming over that, you know, that don't speak it. My father's 72 years old and doesn't speak it. Because, you know, that you, you can get by not speaking it here in the States. Yeah. That's terrific. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Un beso. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, no, I made him blush. <laughs> no, well, I blush easily. Um, All right, because right now we're going to go to Los Tucanes de Tijuana con su tema La Chica Sex. Oh, okay. So para todas las chicas sexy. All right. Go there and bring a full sound. And... <laughs> Y la 
chica se mueve sexy Y la chica se mueve rico Esa chica se mueve suave Esa chica me sube el ritmo Two minutes Spanglish isn't the only Spanish-English hybrid. Carmen Fart is a linguist who's been studying Chicano, one of the street talks of Latino Los Angeles. Chicano English is a dialect of English that grew out of the historical contact between English and Spanish in the Southwest. You get articles written that say Chicano English is just a step on the way to mastery of English. And that's not true at all. Chicano English is now its own vibrant, thriving dialect. It's not going anywhere. Luckily for me, because I do research on Chicano English. Carmen did much of her research with high school kids with Spanish-speaking parents. She took us to a nearby park to hear some Chicano English. Chris can't throw. Wanting the kids to be as relaxed as possible, we put radio mics on two of them. And then we and the camera are keeping well back. So what's up, dog? What's cracking, dog? What's cracking tomorrow? About the Super Bowl? Yeah. Hey, what's up then? We gonna throw a party? What's up? And what girls you gonna have over there? Part. Man, the only thing I know that there's gonna be a bunch of primas here. What about the, what about the um the party you took Mark to. What, Mark Southgate, Ramirez, fool? yeah, in Southgate. That's his family, fool. Nah, are you serious? Yeah, there was a bunch of highness over there, dog. Nah. The highness on the ones that gets the whole head. That's how fine they were, dog. <laughs> no, in terms of slang items, when he asked him who's going to be at the party, is there going to be any hotness there? Hotness? I mean, uh huh. Meaning, are there going to be any good looking girls there? Uh, I'm tired of talking to you, though. I'm tired of talking <laughs> to you, fool. It's been a while, though. Also, uh, the pitch, the intonation, you'll hear some of the syllables drawn out. What? What you mean, foo? Like that, those sorts of things. Uh, that's also very characteristic of Chicano English. What about these fools? What do you think about these fools? you think they're going to grow up to be some real football players or what? Man, that little short foot with uh, cut off sleeves, that's my cousin, dog. He might probably be some. <laughs> the use of foo, uh, for foo, um, for fool, as a term like man or guy, that's very common among kids who speak Chicano English of this age group. In fact, uh, occasionally when I was doing field work and I was interviewing kids who spoke Chicano English, they would actually call me fool, you know, just kind of s slipping it in there the same way we might use man or guy. Or yeah, man. yeah. Keisha, dog. Keisha. Yeah, Keisha up there in Southgate, dog. She's Mexican with a name like that? Yeah, dog. Seriously, she speaks Spanish too? Nah, she don't even speak no Spanish. And they throw in the occasional word in Spanish? Or? Yes, and in fact, what's interesting is that many people believe that Chicano English is a Spanish accent, someone whose first language is Spanish and doesn't speak English well yet. But in fact, as we just heard, we heard Jesse speaking, and he doesn't in fact speak Spanish, only enough to throw in a few words, and those words actually tend to be taboo or swear words. Okay. <laughs> and it's still the classic pattern that the first generation born in the United States often will retain the home language. But by the second generation born here, the home language is very often lost. So I don't think Spanish is a threat to English in any way. I think, if anything, it's Spanish that's in danger and we might want to look out for it. Adios. Like Carmen, other linguists believe Spanish is no more a threat to English than German or Italian, which once provoked similar fears. Six minutes before the hour, I am Shirley Strawberry, right here on the Steve Harvey Morning Show. Morning drive time in L.A. Early in 2003, Hispanic Americans passed African Americans to become the biggest minority. We are a shake your booty radio station. But with young Hispanics moving into English, will Spanish ever have the impact of African American English? You won't believe this one, but guess what? It's another common song. This is my man. This is from Electric Sun. Spread through rap, hip hop, soul, and DJs like Steve Harvey. The black English influence on mainstream American is profound. 
right, here we go. Do you speak American? Um, I speak good enough American. You know, I think there's variations of speaking American. Sure. I don't think there's any one set way because America is so diverse. So I don't think that there's a certain way to speak America. You know, man, Upward America is not my audience. My audience is mostly grassroots people. And I sound mostly like they uncle, so. See, like I said, I sound mostly like they uncle. And that, I'm, I was cool with that. <laughs> that sound good to me. Isn't. You know, isn't is not in my vocabulary. The word is ain't. <laughs> isn't requires my mouth to stretch in a way that it don't stretch. It isn't. And then I leave it out there too long. I look really stupid when, you know, he isn't telling the truth. I actually almost black out when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you say to those people, like some of the people in the school system in uh, L.A., mm -hmm. who uh, say that uh, African-American kids need to learn standard English uh, in order to get on in the world? Well, you know, you do have to be uh, bilingual in this country. And that means you can be very, very adept at slang, but you have to be adept at uh, getting, getting through a job interview. The L.A. school system knows its minority students will need to be, in effect, bilingual. PS 100 in Watts is one of 60 schools using an experimental program called Academic English Mastery. I need all groups to pay attention. Cloyd, I need your focus now. And Gerardo. Oh, Daniel Russell uses a Here game of Jeopardy to teach his grade five Hi. class how I'll to translate their team. home language into mainstream you, American. Okay. Here we go. My grandpa cooked dinner every night. Her person singular. Cook. My grandpa cooks dinner every Cook. night. Which linguistic feature is not in mainstream American English? Third person singular. Yes. yes. And Marisol, how do you code switch this into mainstream American English? My grandpa cooks dinner every night. You just got 500 more points. Yeah! <laughs> He's funny. He is funny. He is funny. Okay, Ariel Barone, what's the answer? He is funny. He is funny? Excellent translation. Here we go. We don't have nothing to do. Oh, oh, no. 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 I, I, okay, quiet please. We don't have nothing to do. Oh, I'm sorry. That is not I'll wait. That is not accurate translation in mainstream American English. So you're at minus. So let me roll. Let's see which team will have an opportunity to get it. I might roll you guys again. One! Yeah. Oh. Anything! 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 We don't have anything to do. Excellent yeah. translation! I think perhaps the biggest misunderstanding is the idea that we are somehow teaching African American language, teaching Ebonics, if you will. We don't need to teach they, African American they don't need to teach language. Them they come they it. already know it. Yeah, yeah. Our task is to help move them towards mastery of the language of school in its oral and written form, but to do that in a way where they are not devalued or where they feel uh, denigrated in any way by virtue of their cultural and linguistic differences. Because when you begin to devalue youngsters and make them feel that who they are doesn't count, then we turn them off from education. Last night, we baked cookies. Are you ready? Okay, number one, what language is it in? AAL. It is an African American language. Number two, what linguistic feature is in AAL? Past tense marker ED. Past tense marker ED, that's two. And how do you code switch it into mainstream American English? Last night we baked cookies. You got 500 more points. <laughs> Is it too easy or I just taught you well this year? <laughs> Students in the program show significant gains in written English. Those behind it believe that unless more teachers treat home language as sympathetically, they'll condemn more generations to school failure. 
language remains a formidable frontier in the legacy of slavery. Three helicopters overhead, and there's a police roadblock up here. In any other big city, you'd think it was a crime scene or an act of terrorism or a bomb scare or something, but this is Los Angeles, the beginning of Beverly Hills here, and this is a big night for the movie industry, the Golden Globe Awards. Nicole Kidman. Movies, TV, and the music industry helped to spread new language. Uh, the nominees for Best Actor. And because the stars live in Hollywood and Hollywood's in California, California English gets an extra boost. The next morning, I'm in Beverly Hills to meet the movie writer and director, Amy Heckerling. Hello, Though she herself comes from the Bronx, she puts a lot of California slang into her scripts. Amy even compiled her own dictionary for her most famous movie and the TV series that followed it, Clueless. We noticed looking over your shoulder a minute ago that you had um, a page for expressions that are for good, something that's good yeah. and some for bad. Would you read us from each of those pages? Uh, Swiss flavor butter, coolio smooth, uh, super, money, nails, tits, as in it's the tits, fion, like fine, broken up into a bunch of syllables, kick and juice, keen, funky, monster, proper, rad, noble, wicked, tubular, trippy, stoked, Rules, rocks, stellar, tasty, sweet. How about bad? <laughs> Page for bad. <laughs> this could go on forever. No. Um, random, heinous, cheesy, uh, blows, bites, bogus, bunk, brick, bum, bum deal, bunk, busted, bug, chicken, shredded, drip, wretched, clueless. Sucks, the classic. Uh, <laughs> and uh, whenever young actors came in, I would always say, what do you say for good, for bad? Amy's movie, Clueless, achieved iconic status and introduced California teen slang to the rest of America. Ew, get off of me! Ah, oh, I'm it. Nice stems. Thanks. Whatever. Oh, did I miss something? Did you take your hair back? Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's do a lap before you commit your location. Hello. Survey set? I thought it reeked. I believe that was your designer imposter perfume. Clueless satirizes California mores and teen talk. Winnie Holtzman aimed for naturalism in the cult TV series My So-Called Life, in which she chronicled teenage angst. She often writes in this coffee shop. A lot of the waitresses would be around 17, 18, and I would hear them discussing certain things that I just would write right down. Um, yeah, I'd like a diet Pepsi. Okay. I'll have a nice tea, please. Okay, Thank you. Thanks. You said you were trying to put yourself inside the head of teenagers, one of which you used to be. Well, I think it just, you know, it's like I said, it's a biological time. I mean, biologically, you're, you're, you, everything in you is telling you to move on, to move away, to grow up, and to leave behind the things of childhood. Tell, tell us your thoughts about why they create their own language, teenagers. I think it's perfectly natural. At that point, um, you know, your peer group becomes incredibly important to you. Your little tribe of friends becomes your new family. And you need to have... Everything symbolizes that. Everything, the clothes you wear, the way you speak. And I think people... I, I mean, language is... Um, there's no... There's almost nothing more personal than how you express yourself. and 
I'm curious to find out how California teenage slang has moved on since the early 90s when Clueless and My So-Called Life were first released. So I'm in Irvine, south of LA, to meet a bunch of teens from the local high school, whom I can call, as we all seem to these days, you guys. Do you guys still say, so, not, whatever? Yes. Yeah, yeah Clueless, because like now I'm like permanently like like messed up because because like I say like like and dude every other word because of that movie it's horrible <laughs> you can't get it out you can't get clueless out of your system is that I uh... saw it once <laughs> really? it became kind of like a culture trend sort of so like a lot of kids started saying it and then people would do the how do you do the whatever's whatever moron get the picture you're a total loser <laughs> Hey, could I ask you um, some um, expressions and ask you what they mean? Um, tight. Tight. <laughs> How do you say it? Tight. tight. Is it is it about tight. appearance? Oh, like if you got a new car and it's really nice to say my new car is tight, you know. Uber. You can be an Uber nerd. Or no, Uber it's, nerd. it's like it's like super nerd. Or, yeah, or Uber anything. Fob. Asians who came to America not too recently. Like when you speak and you still have an accent, like your English is still kind of fobby. <laughs> Word. Like I agree. Yeah. Word. How do you say it? That test was so hard. Word. Word. <laughs> Meaning. I agree. <laughs> oh, the other person says word. Yeah. I see. Yeah. That I test word. was so hard. Yeah. Word. Word. <laughs> What's up? What's up, girl? <laughs> yeah. A lot of like those kinds of things come from like the rap and the rap music, as you hear them sort of like, oh my peeps and y'all, yo. This guys always like they're walking and they see another guy, they're like, hey, sup. Sup. The middle seat and the back seat, like it's bitch seat, like you're sort of like the bitch, oh, yeah. like you know, like you're my bitch, you know, sort of like that. <laughs> but we we use bitch like, dude, you're my bitch, you know, or oh, so and so is gonna be my bitch for like homecoming like or whatever. Prison, you know. <laughs> I made that test my bitch. <laughs> You can nail that test and like you aced it or yeah, you did yeah. really well on we'll it. Like Many people across the country are familiar with the California dialect from movies like Clueless. It includes some shifts in the sound system. So for example, uh, one of the things I've studied is ooh fronting. Words that have ooh in them in California English are often pronounced very close to the front of the mouth. So the word do might be pronounced more like do, I do. do. Oh, very good. That's it. I do. And also words with O, oh, go, go, okay. I'm going to go. Yes, that, that, that's also common. Put those together in some sentences that sound like California. Right? You're going to go? Oh, my God. You like him? You really do? <laughs> I'm totally surprised. <laughs> I do, too, though. <laughs> and is that growing, or is that just a passing thing that we recognized as Valley Girl or whatever it was called? Um, years ago. Oh, no. I can hear these features in radio announcers now, my age or older, on TV. It's definitely the California dialect is here to stay. It's not just a passing fad. What are some of your favorite examples of that? Of, of uh, California? Of things? California. Yeah. I like I'm all. I think that's a very good one, to be all something as a quotative, introducing quoted speech. So I'm all, I don't think I'm going to go, and he's all, I think you should, and I'm all, why? And he's all, because it'll be fun, and I'm all, I don't think so, et cetera. Uh, something occurred to me, do men speak Valley Girl? Ah, that's such a good question, and it's one I wanted to explore. Men speak Surfer Dude. Surfer Dude. Yes. Dude, that was gnarly. That peak just jacked up so quick, there was no way, man. I got thrown with that lip. Couldn't even get to my feet. Surfer dudes and surfing slang have had a seminal effect on California speech. Dude, I sunk my inside rail on that turn, man. That was lame. So much new language is generated by the California culture of being extremely energetic in the sun. Where better to start than Ventura County and Surfer's Point? and the place where many surfers hang out, the Badass Cafe. In the 1960s, the Beach Boys were the first to put surf slang into hit songs like Surf and Safari. Hi. Hi there. 
I've come to the Badass Cafe to meet someone who lives to surf. Busy, busy? Not too much today. The surf's too good? So surf's too here. good, for sure. Yeah. For sure. George Plummerty has qualified as a paralegal, but he prefers to work here at the Badass. Okay. Three bucks, please. Yes. What he earns here Thank pays for his passion to surf. When he finishes work, George agrees to take me for a ride in his classic Volkswagen minibus and show me world-famous Rincon Point. I've had this car about seven months now. Oh, really? Um, this is you haven't had it since 1970. No, okay. I haven't been alive since 1970. Oh. I was only born in 75. Right? Okay. Oh, <laughs> California speech seems to be having a growing influence on mainstream America. When we get out to Rincon, you'll see the point actually comes all the way into here before it ends. These little guys are surfing a spot called The Wall. Yeah. It's a fun little surf spot. That single fin's gonna kill it. This is gonna be great. I want to know if surf slang is still shaping California speech. Wow, there's a lot of people in the water. Look at that great wave that guy is still going on. He's going to set up for a little barrel on the inside. 20 years ago, for our TV series, The Story of English, we filmed a rock band called The Surf Pumps. Straight drops on both sides. Super gnarly. I started by showing George a clip from our old film. I think it'll interest you. So, uh, Mark, what did you do today? Well, you know, like, I got this new stick and I was, like, you know, like, uh, cranking on some Radical 2. Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure. How big was it? It was, like, radically overhead, man. I'll give it up. This is take two. Life's a beat. That's great. So check it out, dude. You know, like, I was cruising the beach yesterday. And, you know, the waves, they were totally cranking. I mean, it was really hot. These certain words find their way into the whole language and some of it's pretty off the wall. In surfing when the wave curls over and that's like the tube or the pocket. So if you're in the tube you're taking the highest risk and you're very rad. <laughs> I saw this chick and she had a totally tight bod and she was totally buff and that that means that she is in shape and she's clean <laughs> and she's looking good. Clean. Well, some guys wearing some rad outfit just go, wow, man, that's rad. That's pretty gnarly. I mean, cooking. Look at this. We all got the same watches. It's totally rad. Way <laughs> rad. Way rad. Fully rad. So is that stuff still current? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Those words are all used and definitely, like, find their way into vernacular speech. You know, you hear everyone describing things as rad, yeah. or, you know, or as people being, like, like hot or... Uh, or truly radical. A lot of those phrases that came out in the early 80s got, got co-opted. You know, they got taken over by like some, some corporate people that used them to, to schlag t-shirts to the max. That's a wonderful example of something that was taken by Pepsi in the 80s, you know, and just hoard until it's not usable. What are some of the new expressions? Uh, full on. Full on's a great example. Uh, off the wall, he uses that. That's another phase you hear a lot, you know? Or uh, right on, or fully, or like... Fat? That was fat, like a fat air. That's fat like with a pH. <laughs> oh, I, fat, and fat air means going like off really, the wave in yeah, the air. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, and being really high. Surfers themselves have just moved into the mainstream of the culture, and that's why their expressions are headed in that direction, you know. We have like a lot of people that are professionals. They they go out and surf in the morning, you know, get get as crazy as they can and, and really push themselves to their limits and then, you know, take a shower and go to the law office. And they're going to carry over that language with them, you know, and a great example of that would be like the phrase caught inside. You know, you hear that all over the place and describing any situation where you suddenly have to to try and deal with with a whole lot of stuff coming at you at the same moment. It seems that surf slang remains as vigorous and inventive as ever. Listen to George describe the perfect ride. You know, waves break in sections. So you can talk about like, wow, you know, that first section was sick. You know, that drop was really heavy, made that bottom turn, came around, went through that mushy part, and then it just jacked on that second bowl. Got that floater, came into the inside, and just cracked that lip as hard as I could. Set up for that barrel and just right out in the green there, man. Sick. But, um, yeah, that's very interesting. The, um, have you done any writing on the language, Charles? No, not really.
New language always grows at the cutting edge of life. And California's lifestyle is nothing if not cutting edge. We use a lot of terms that helps describe skateboarding. Um, goofy foot, regular foot, switch, going fakey. Rippers, you know, ripping are just uh, adjectives to describe kids or skaters that are just ripping, tearing it up out there on the course and just having a good time and ripping. When you get into a park and there's a lot of guys skating and uh, everyone's hyping each other on and everyone's trying to outdo each other, you know, that's the time to just really go out and, and uh, you know, blast the biggest airs you can and do the longest grinds you can and uh, just uh, perform as best you can. Steve Badillo's slang is so far out for me that he needs to translate almost every other word. In skateboarding, one little false move, one little thing off, and you're, you're, you're slamming, you're taking, you're taking a fall. But I like blasting airs, for sure. And that's what you were doing over the doorway here? Sure, that was a frontside air over the gap. Coping is basically the steel pipe or plastic PVC that's on the tops of the lip of the ramps. We call it coping. That's what you grind on? That's what you grind on and uh, do lip tricks on, is on the coping. Street skating, vert skating, pool skating, and downhill bombing, which, you know, most skaters love. Just the basic, natural form of just going down a hill and going as fast as you can, and carving it up, and, uh, and having fun with it. There's a whole new lexicon for snowboarders. Sticking it clean means pulling off a trick to perfection. If you can repeat the trick again and again, you got it dialed in. That's that sick. That's a super, like, super sick stuff. Like, sick? Yeah, it's pretty much sick. Like, someone goes off and does something and stomps it clean, then that's, you're gonna like give them props and it's gonna do something sick and then that's what you're gonna like. It's gonna raise the level of riding and then everybody's like, just get everybody amped up. Jake Goff's snowboard lingo isn't the only thing that fascinates me about his speech. Young Californians, and now much of the world, say like where we once said um or er. And they use like to mean quote, unquote. Jake uses like 13 times in both senses in the next 74 words. I, like, what I say, like, sometimes people just don't understand it. Like, all, like, my terminology for certain things, which is, like, like, for my clique, my group, like, my friends, like, nobody else understands it. So if I go someplace else, like, someplace new, they're like, they don't know it. So, like, and they're like, they're like, what are you talking about? Wars and armies have always added words to our language. Loud and vicious on the pivot. What? Love, fight, love, fight. The air we go. Words like shock and awe, collateral damage, and weapons of mass destruction. The U.S. military has always been a forcing ground for social change. They were among the first national institutions to confront racism and segregation. But it's a four kilo. Hi, sir. Morning, Let's go. Sir. The street has no live ammo to brass for this time, sir. Now they're on the front line of the war on sexism. The Marine Corps drills this into its new recruits. There's a green zone, a yellow zone, and a red zone. The green zone would be just a normal interaction between uh, male and female. The yellow zone would probably be the sort of comments where 
it could be taken as something that, that may be sexually oriented or may, uh, may cause someone to feel uncomfortable. The red zone is considered just to be a blatant sexual remark, like check him or her out, uh, look what they have there, I want to get some of that. How has the language changed as far as the way the, way the men talk? Like cursing and telling jokes. And yeah. Like I said, it all depends on how you are. If you can tell a joke just as good as they can, laugh. Tell yours, too. If you're the type that you don't want to hear jokes like that, you tell them that, and they should respect that. If you'd like it, hey, by all means. If you don't, say something. The military reflects what's happening in society at large. The triumph of political correctness, or euphemism, perhaps. But in language these days, Americans seem reluctant to give offense to anyone. What is the Marine Corps policy on gays in the, in the Marines? Marine Corps policy on homosexuals in, in the military is the, we, we don't ask and they don't, they don't offer that information up. Basically, the, the don't ask, don't tell policy. And is that working? I think it is, sir. Mm -hmm. Gay Pride Day in San Francisco. Tom Amiano, a gay comedian in the 1980s, ran for mayor in 2003. Today, many of the words Tom uses to describe the march, queen, queer, fag, dyke, would once have been seen as offensive, homophobic. But today, these women delight in calling themselves dykes on bikes. Dykes on bikes is always a thrill. Dykes on bikes, which always traditionally starts off the parade, because we're now accumulating a history. You'll see the uh, s and community and the leather community, the cross-dressing drag queen community, gay cops uh, always have a, b a big contingent in that group, gay clergy. You'll even see, yes, my friends, gay Republicans. I used to do a joke about them, about their cheer being, we're here, we're queer, we're sorry. The word queer was once a hot topic for the committee that organizes the Gay Pride March. I think the Pride Committee got very radical in 1993 um, when the theme for the parade was the year of the queer. Um, that forced us, that placed it on a national platform, the word queer. Calvin, is it analogous to some blacks calling themselves nigger nowadays, but being very offended if if some if a white person? Calls that's them that's nigger? exactly that's exactly what it is. Um, and how do you describe I, that movement of the word? What, why is it evolved like that? I, I believe it's uh, because people feel uh, disempowered, and this is one way to empower themselves. If we can use the word queer so many times that it just becomes a normal word in our language without any consequence, then I think we see ourselves as being more empowered. So it sort of um, proves the point that you can change the meaning of words. Thank you! We're here, we're proud, we're not hiding, and we want to uh, take away any of the prejudices and want to say to you, I'm not going to hide it so that you can continue to persecute us. The ability to speak and understand language almost defines what it is to be human. But some human abilities are increasingly being matched or surpassed by computers. Today, in fact, the cutting edge of research in Silicon Valley involves teaching computers to speak to us and understand us, and thus be easier to use. That research raises fundamental questions about American speech and about language itself. To learn more about all this, I've come to meet Cliff Nass, a professor here at Stanford University. Humans are what we call voice-activated. 
the minute the brain hears something that sounds even remotely like human speech, we bring to bear all the rules and expectations that we do when dealing with other people. So we listen for the same cues. What's the gender of the voice? What's the emotion? What's the personality? How should I speak back? What are my expectations and understanding? And we basically can't help it. And so what sort of things do they do? Well, they respond with politeness and a whole range of other responses. So it isn't such a bad joke that Canadians say thank you to the uh, automatic teller machine. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, it's highly natural. It's probably much harder to avoid saying it than to say it. Voice-activated technology has enormous commercial possibilities. The German automaker BMW hired Cliff Nass to research the right voice for its latest luxury sedan. A BMW salesman let me test drive the vehicle and the voice Cliff chose for it. Navigation menu. You have selected the following entry. It talks to you. I mean, telephone. Pardon me? Telephone. Telephone menu. You see, it, it, then it keeps asking. No, it didn't like what I said, so it, it, it turned it off. So one of the things, the first consideration in choosing a voice is should it be male or female? In fact, in the original German version of the interface, they chose a female voice. And German reactors reacted very negatively, saying that I don't want to be told how to drive by a woman. And in fact, they actually had a product recall requiring them to, in fact, have a male voice instead. But what about American men? I mean, uh, they're much more um, amenable to uh, being told by women how to drive, aren't they? <laughs> well, I don't know that they'd want to pay extra for it, though. So just tell me what your input was in arriving at the voice that the BMW uses. We've generated about 25 models, everything from Knight Rider to HAL, the computer in 2001, to uh, the guy who's usually named Buck on the stagecoach, a sort of wacky older guy who ride, rode shotgun, right. to a best friend, to a golfing buddy, etc., and went through all those and said, which one would best fit the, the positioning of the BMW automobile? We then went through and listened to hundreds and thousands of voices to come up with those that sounded like a co-pilot. Male, slightly younger than the average age of the driver so they wouldn't feel threatened. Um, uh, a masculine voice, but not overly masculine. Speaks relatively slowly so that it doesn't feel like he's taking, trying to take control. And from that, we then selected the voice. Are other products than cars going to have voices and personalities too? There's going to be a spread of voice technologies from the high-end to lower-end things. More and more products having those technologies. And then there are going to be the issues of how do we integrate them all? Do we want a cacophony of voices in our home screaming for attention at various times? Oh my God, to get home after a hard day and 15 <laughs> things in the house start talking to you? It's not clear that people are going to want to have long conversations with their toasters or refrigerators. We have to design around that problem. The way we react to voices becomes much more complicated when we can also see who's talking. This is Baldy, and what's special about Baldy is he's able to say anything you want him to say with extremely good lip movement that matches what he says. Let's Robin, get, what would you get like him to say? say something. Okay, what would you like him to say? Um, how about, uh, my name is Baldy. Welcome to the Stanford lab. I'm going to type that in, and then we'll just have Baldy repeat it. My name is Baldy. Welcome to the Stanford lab. What about a, a real human with a synthesized voice? Well, we can show you what that looks like. Windfall is the story of an ordinary man in extraordinary circumstances. Ben Leinberg is a financially challenged English professor with a wife and two kids. That mismatch leads people to think family. that he's less intelligent, they trust the synthetic voice less, and trust his face less than if he spoke like, quote, a real person. Does it have the In experiment after experiment, the Cliff Nass has found that this kind of mismatching it's creates mistrust. Windfall is the story of an ordinary Baldy is not trusted when he speaks with a real human voice. Baldy is more trusted and more liked when he speaks with his synthetic voice, because he himself is synthetic. The implications of this research become really serious when mismatching is applied to race and gender. Oh. <laughs> Here we see a picture of you. Do I speak American? Here we're using a technology called Veepers, and what we were able to do is just take a still photograph of you,
you'll see that the face moves and blinks. That's all being generated by the computer. But most powerfully, we can make you speak in different voices. If I spoke like this, would you hire me for a job requiring contact with the public? So we know immediately that that's a male, an older male speaking, a strong, deep voice suggesting credibility, and it fits very well with the face we see. Now we can ask the question, what would happen if that same face spoke with a voice that didn't match? And here's what that sounds like. If I spoke like this, would you hire me for a job requiring contact with the public? That's funny. I mean, uh, it, it makes me sound like a white southerner. Exactly. But interestingly, that voice is not from a white southerner. That voice is the voice of um, John Boa, who you spoke with earlier. And here's John Boa saying the same sentence. If I spoke like this, would you hire me for a job requiring contact with the public? Even though those two voices were literally identical, people listening perceive them differently. And we know he doesn't speak like that normally. He puts these accents on for, the, for his own research purposes. Do you have him speaking with his own voice? Yeah, here's something we heard him say earlier. Hello, I'm calling about the apartment you have advertised in the paper. That mismatch can lead to mistrust, perceived lack of intelligence, unwillingness to purchase, etc. You mean somebody seeing a black African-American speaking without an accent they consider appropriate, they mistrust? Exactly. And that wouldn't just apply to African-Americans. That would apply to any ethnicities. People, when they see a face, they bring to bear stereotypes of how that person should behave, think, and speak. When those stereotypes run counter, people say there's something wrong here, and that mistrust has consequences. As we've seen all across the country, there are, there are stereotypes of the way people perceive um, some racially associated accents, regional accents, and so on. Is this technology just going to reinforce um, those stereotypes? Whatever stereotypes people bring to bear when hearing a human speaking in a certain way, they bring those exact same stereotypes to bear when dealing with computers. If the computer has a female voice, it will be perceived as doing stereotypically better in areas that it's, are typically associated with women, for example, discussions of love and relationships, and will be perceived as being a worse teacher of technical subjects like physics. So what will determine whether this use of computers and synthesized voices reinforce those stereotypical perceptions, or is the, the potential for erasing them? And it's a great question. It has the potential for both. So, for example, let's say we know that this regional accent is stereotyped as being unintelligent. Let's make sure we never use it in any application that would imply a need for intelligence. Then those stereotypes would be strongly reinforced. But let's say if we do the opposite, that would then, because of the way our brains are voice activated, would lead us to weaken that stereotype and potentially eliminate it. Going back to the comedian who does the uh, brain surgery jokes uh, with a southern <laughs> accent, in other words, have all brain surgery instruction done with a southern accent? Exactly. That would tend to lead us over time to believe that, in fact, brain surgeons can be or should be southern. Nine zero three six. Nine zero three six. And dial. Next. Dial. Hi, you've reached Alf and David. Please leave us a message, and we'll get right back to you. Hi, sweetie. It's Daddy. I'm um, driving along the coast of California on a beautiful sunny day. And I wondered how things are in uh, Cambridge, Mass. Anyway, um, talk to you soon. Love, bye for now. Navigation system. Navigation menu. Navigation address book. Navigation menu. Address book. Pardon me? You have selected the following entry. Help takes you at any time to this general help with options the possible command options are read out to you help yes or no yes help help everything in the american experience 
each new frontier encountered, geographical, spiritual, technical, has altered our language. What kind of a frontier are we crossing by teaching computers our most fundamental human skill, to speak? That question leaves us one last stop on our journey. From San Francisco, I follow the coast north to the city of Seattle. An early start this morning to meet someone who's at the cutting edge of voice-activated computers. But his job at Microsoft keeps him so busy that the only chance we had to talk was on his drive to work. XT Huang is an immigrant from China, and he's the man who's teaching our computers to talk to us. We want to bring this benefit to the computer so people can easily get information from computers. Is technology tending to yeah. homogenize language? If you have a strong accent, computer will probably just ask you, what, I'm sorry, what did you say? If you actually interact with today's computer system, probably you have heard that many times. I should just park here. Is that okay? Good. Microsoft aims to develop computer programs that will recognize any American dialect. Right now, however, business logic suggests an initial investment in speech that is easiest for computers to understand. I think you told us earlier that if they sounded like CNN, they would be recognized by the computer. If you use standard American English, probably you will get the work done easier, faster. So if XD Huang is right, voice-activated computers could create an enormous drive towards a standardized American English. People are always telling me that television has this effect. But on this journey, we've seen that in many ways, Americans are talking less alike, not more. And it seems to me that radio, television, and movies help us understand other ways of speaking. But they don't make us speak that way. Perhaps computers will, and if they do, we'll all end up sounding much more like one another, or rather, sounding much more like our computers. Welcome to United Airlines Flight Information Line. Please enter or say the United Flight Number. United 24. United Flight 24 is scheduled to depart on time at 9 a.m. from Seattle, Washington. Hello? Will we all end up sounding like that? Personally, I don't think so. We just aren't programmed that way. Our rich diversity, the strong pull of local identity, the joys of new jargon and slang are all too much part of who we are as Americans and as human beings. Well, I've reached the end of the road. We began our journey on the ferry boat from Nova Scotia. We end heading out from Seattle. Heading not into the sunset of our language, as some fear, but a continuous new dawn. As it comes to an end, what an experience this has been. This journey through the American language and the people who speak it, in all their variety and vitality, informality and creativity. How to sum all that up? Certainly no better than Walt Whitman did more than a century ago when he wrote, our language is not an abstract construction of dictionary makers, but has its basis broad and low, close to the ground, truer than ever. And like, how cool is that?
the down low, the skinny, and the 411 on how you speak American. Visit us at pbs.org. While you're there, get tips for starting your own PBS program club so you can continue to speak American with your friends and family. Do You Speak American is available on DVD for $69.95 or VHS for $59.95. A companion book is available for $24.95 plus shipping. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Speak American has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, promoting excellence in the humanities. Additional funding is provided by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. I am PBS.